In the ancient Hebrew calendar, there are two times of the year that are seen as kind of New Year's. You have Rosh Hashanah, the commemoration of the creation of the world that we read of in Genesis. But there is also a kind of national New Year at Passover, where God leads his people, the people of Israel, out of slavery in Egypt, leading them through the wilderness in hopes of finding the promised land. In both cases, in Genesis and in Exodus, man and woman are both called to act as stewards over creation and to escape the thwarting presence of idols and spiritual malevolence. Man and woman are made in the image and likeness of love. And in Eden, they are instructed how to name the living creatures and tend the garden. It is Adam who names the creatures. And it is in Eve we discover the title, Mother of All the Living. Christian authors, many great heroes of mine, but also interpret that phrase, mother of the living, to also refer to the prophecy that God would become man through the womb of a particular woman in time. In Exodus, the image of the great Passover and of the flight of the children of Israel through the Red Sea into the wilderness and the theophany on Sinai is an image of God meeting his people, making a covenant with them, renewing their dignitas, their dignity, as image bearers of that divine love. Now they are to make their nation, Israel, their covenant people, a moving portable garden on earth, through the wilderness until they might reach the promised land. Later on, under the reign of David, conquering Jerusalem, and under the reign of Solomon, building the temple, the physical temple made with stone was to be seen as a kind of focal point where God would meet with humanity and carry out that Edenizing project, spreading that image of human love, dignity, and respect throughout all of creation. There are many competing gods in the ancient world. Baal, Chemosh, Ashtoreth, Zeus, Thor. And all of these, including deities that are still well studied and understood in the farthest corners of creation, did not view their servants as children worthy of respect but instead saw them as slaves who needed to be bent to their will. And though there were glimpses of truth there, and while there were among the polytheists such brilliant minds as Aristotle and Plato, and luminaries who still fill our hearts with joy and wonder, the emphasis on many of these cultural phenomena was that the ruler or the king was the one who held total power or sway. And that the hierarchies or castes in society must bow to the will of the one or the many. And in that battle, where human dignity labored under the yoke of pharaohs, and the name pharaoh, by the way, means lord of death, And in that day and age where people sought meaning and purpose in images carved with stone and paint and frescoes of beauty, think of the Parthenon, think of the Acropolis, think of the Great Pyramid, think of the great and wondrous work of the Aztecs and of the Incas later on. What we have here are peoples yearning for the image of total beauty the invisible to become visible, the transcendent to become local and enfleshed and embodied. 
a yearning for a true presence of love on the planet Earth. And all of this we see revealed in the arrival of a new year or a new age with the arrival of the New Testament, the New Covenant, the fulfillment, not the abolition of the old. Where this idea of the temple made with stones in which God's presence dwelt, now is fulfilled by the image of God become a human being. God now becoming a temple of flesh through the flesh and blood and love and nurturing presence of his mother, Mary. And in doing so, raising all of creation up with himself. And in the New Testament, Paul would emphasize in Corinthians and in other epistles, how now, though there are good distinctions of ethnicity, great distinctions of culture, brilliant distinctions of tradition and of tribe and of nationhood, that there is a universal principle that all people are, well, endowed by their creator with unalienable rights. That the states, that the imperial arm cannot remove and that it is the duty of the imperial power to protect and safeguard. This is precisely why the early church spread so swiftly. Slave girls who were taught that they were only property realized that in heaven's eyes they were queens. Children who were beaten severely and treated as less than nothing in the eyes of of their owners in the Roman world now could look into the eyes of their master and say, God shed blood for me that I might walk in dignity and in true fraternity. And it was seen plainly and simply through the calling of fishermen, tax collectors, and prostitutes that God in coming as man seeking to save and find out that which is lost, sought deeply to unite all men and all women around that revelation of his humanity. Through fellowship, through the breaking of the bread, so that wherever two or three are gathered in his name, the name of love, there he is present. And that sin and death are defeated at the pulpit of the cross. Now this new covenantal idea, according to Tom Holland, author of Dominion, is the very basis of human rights, at least in its Western iteration. The ancient Greeks may have prided themselves in democracy, but not all Greeks were treated equal. Women were second-class citizens in Athens. Slaves could not vote. The rest were barbarians. They could not speak the language. And when Alexander, the student of Aristotle, the student of Plato, the student of Socrates, tried to unite Greek and non-Greek in his Hellenistic world, it led to factions and fighting and jealousy. Even when Caesar rose to power, and held the whole world under his dominion and sway. The Romanitas, Romanus, was a real thing. The Pax Romana, the Roman peace, was the theater in which God would be crucified. It was the theater in which this homogenous coming together was not around the eternal dignity of the Pantocrator, Christ the King, the teacher, the priest depicted on the ceiling of the cathedral, the transcendent dignity of man, but instead on the deification of the state. And the Soviet power, and the fascist power, and now a kind of secularist, atheistical power seeks to do the same. And in all of those systems, all of them, there were men and women 
who did not merely see the world through lenses of prejudice. Though, of course, this drove deeply the massacres and bloodshed of the 20th century, particularly in the light of Nazism. But we also saw people who were duped and fooled by charismatic rhetoric and by the group think of many who wanted to get along to build that utopian Tower of Babel to reach into the heavens or like Pol Pot to get back to year zero. And when I look deeply at many theological voices now, there is a deep tendency, a horrific tendency, to try and create a world where we do not dialogue either with those who are not our co-religionists and attempt to say that if there is to be a new horizon in this new covenantal world, that it must not include the contemporary tax collector and contemporary prostitute and contemporary sinner. And that is anathema to the gospel. It is anathema to the gospel. Christ reaches his arms out to everyone, to every soul in hopes that some might come to the knowledge of the truth. And yet, this principle has fundamentally been lost. That we are now living in a time and in a season, in the year 2022, where we have the opportunity to take that vocation as stewards, as image bearers of God's love, seriously, or we have the opportunity to relegate that to what we do on Sundays or what we privately do between us and our Bible. A relationship with Jesus of Nazareth is not a private business. Is it ever going to be a private business? In the Roman Empire, there were slots for many gods in their theology. They were perfectly fine having a temple to Aphrodite, Zeus, some of the German uh, household gods, I'm sure, had their own slots in their great and mighty edifice in Rome. They were quite syncretistic and perfectly fine with it. And in doing so, quite relativistic, so long as Caesar remained on top. You just had to offer a little pinch of incense. And the early church could have done this. They could have said, Christ is simply one of many of the legal religions of the empire, and we are going to be perfectly content with our Christian corner, and when we leave our door, we will leave behind this whole silly business of human universal dignity. And instead, uh, we're just going to turn a blind eye to continued slavery, and we're going to continue a blind eye to the gladiatorial games. And uh, yes, we will still carry out the pagan festivals, because after all, we need to... um, try to be peaceable with everyone, even at the expense of the truth. They could have done this, and many wanted to. But time and time again, the martyrs want to be fed by lions, fed too by wild beasts. Time and time again, Cecilia's and Lucy's and Agatha's and Perpetua's and Polycarp's, and Ignatius is one to their deaths in order to demonstrate that the transcendent dignity of man and woman illumined by what God did on the cross means far more than placating the evils that exist within a current paradigm. The contemporary churches must wake up to this reality. We will either unite among this principle or we will dissolve into irrelevant happy talk and psychological babble. The real red line in the sand has everything to do with whether we actually believe the good news is actually good or whether it is even news. And there is infinite hope, vast hope, precisely because 
As we are speaking now, in light of a culture that is politically divided between right and left, as yes, there are elites in the world carrying out nefarious actions over the many, justifying their ends through devious means, just as we are faced with natural and social disasters and spiritual crises of unbelief and ritualism at the expense of personal relationship, none of those problems are new. And the good news is our God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that he is inspiring, even in this generation, modern-day martyrs, modern-day prophets to stand up. Great wisdom is drawn from the example of the Baptist. In the beginning of the Gospel according to John, the Pharisees send to John representatives who ask, Are you the Messiah? And he responds, No. Are you the prophet? And he responds, No. Are you Elijah? He responds, No. These are all figures who point to great power in the eschaton. The prophet is presumably a reference also to the Messiah. Elijah is in response to a fulfillment of Malachi. That will be for another podcast later. But instead, John hears these interlocutors ask, well then who are you so that we might give an answer to them that sent us? And he responds, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord, as spoke the prophet Isaiah. Behold, I baptize you with water, but there is one coming after me, mightier than I, the latchet of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie, who shall baptize you with fire and with the Holy Spirit. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he shall gather his Wheat into the barn, but the chaff he shall burn with unquenchable fire. And in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, he points to those there and says, words to the effect, Do not say to yourselves, you have Abraham for a father. For I tell you that God is able to raise up stones, raise up children for Abraham from these stones. In essence, the idea is we are not made Christians. We are not made disciples of Jesus. We are not necessarily even made good people because we attend a physical building on Sundays or watch it virtually from a streaming service or necessarily know about Jesus or necessarily are able to quote uh, the maxim of the golden rule or even because we generally think we live a good life. No, we are made fundamentally new people for a new age, for a new year, in this year 2022. We are made transcendently renewed. We are born again by recognizing that the weight of all the human and spiritual malevolence that exists in the world, that the weight of sin and of death, that all the weight of my sins and your sins and our sins can only be answered by the arrival of one who can bear an infinite burden. And the only one who can bear an infinite burden is an infinite man. And the only way we could ever find an infinite man is if divinity takes on flesh, if only love becomes man, if only God becomes incarnate. And receiving in a personal relationship that gift that we discover every time we see the manger and the infant and the king humbled to the point of death on the cross. And we understand the words, it is finished, paid in full. We realize that is meant past, present and future for me and for you. Now, its application in our lives and our walk with him requires for us to fully and absolutely 
to have received his love and to understand our responsibility as image bearers of that love in the world, as disciples, as apostolis, sent out ones. And yet, when I look at this new year, 2022, and when I see all the madness that is going on, my heart rejoices in so much as if God could preserve the truth to 120 souls who received the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2 with religious and social leaders wanting to murder and crucify every one of them. If God could shake the rafters through the example of Athanasius who defended the divinity of Jesus against the bishops and against the emperor when the whole world was set against him. If the church could stand up for the dignity of the human person in face of the prevailing belief in slavery through the abolitionist movement in the 19th century, if the church could stand against the evils of communism and fascism in the 20th, saying, no, man and woman do have transcendent dignity, then we in the 21st and in the year 2022 can do the same. We simply have to, like Mary, upon hearing her vocation to be the mother of the living word, we simply have to say yes. And having heard that yes, by grace through faith in his name, walk filled with his love. If you have not done so, if you have simply heard about his voice and not stopped to hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. In the words of Jesus himself, at the beginning of the gospel according to St. Mark, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the good news. Brothers and sisters, I with you must continually discover that gift of that word repent, which is metanoia, the renewal of the mind, a life truly reformed, a life that is a new life from above. As Paul tells us in the book of Romans, I believe it's in chapter 12, be ye not conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. As Jesus reminds us in John 3, unless ye are born again, ye cannot see the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. That which is of the flesh is flesh. That which is of the spirit is spirit. To receive the Holy Spirit, to receive the gift of God in Jesus, who is the Lord, is to encounter more than simply another path like the Eightfold Path for Life or the 613 commandments of the law, as good as they are, as true as they are, as righteous as they are, but to realize that we are receiving the free gift of God's salvation, redemption, for us who are incapable of saving ourselves. We live at a time where they speak of climate disasters, and they speak of political battles. And I know many good members of the church who are focused on those social issues. And as important as they are, let us not lose sight 
that it is neither in the idols of right or left that we trust, nor is it only in material knowledge of the natural world that we trust, as good as it is, but it is in Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, that we trust. And into his hands we commit all that we are. I pray that your 2022 might be filled with that grace. And together, let us strive on forward, inspired as Abraham Lincoln taught us by the better angels of our nature. That we might discover that new birth of freedom that comes through Christ alone. I look forward to hearing from you in the comment section. I pray that you have a blessed New Year.